In just over a week, Jews all around the world are going to be gathering at our Seder tables to recount the story of Pesach, the great meta-narrative of our people, the story of the exodus from Egypt. And this year, this practice, which is the very heart of Jewish life, is deeply fraught because many of us will come to the table holding grief and fear and hurt in our hearts. And for many of us, even imagining sitting at the table with other people in our extended families and friend circles whose words and ideas may have caused us pain over the course of the last six months is deeply challenging. Some of us are terrified. Today, we begin to prepare for that experience by taking a step back together and considering the story of Passover and its meaning for us today. Ours is a story of a people that had been harmed and humiliated for hundreds of years, but were ultimately able to walk toward liberation from degradation to dignity, from darkness to light, from enslavement to freedom. But there are so many different ways to tell this story, so many different rituals that can help emphasize or de-emphasize different parts of those, that, that story. And the choices that we make are highly consequential. So I want to invite us to consider this one ritual. At the Seder, sometime after dinner and before Hallel, we rise with our belly full and we open the door to our homes. And we say, Shvoch chamatcha, ala goyim asher lo yaducha. Pour out your rage against the nations that do not know you. Pour out your wrath on them. May your blazing anger overtake them. This message is tough. For many of us, we either ignore or erase this part of the Seder. Some of us are already asleep at the table by this point in the Seder. It seems to clash for many of us with our deepest Jewish sensibilities. The idea of holding a revenge fantasy in the Passover Seder seems truly incongruent with who we are or who we hope to be. But I have to be honest, this year, I imagine that even some who are repelled by the sentiment in years past might find it resonant. Because this year we come to the Seder table shattered. For the past six months, we have been holding a different kind of pain. Shock and horror and anguish over the atrocities that were committed against our family. A sense of abandonment and existential loneliness. The fear of a future uncertain is almost too much to hold. Maybe this year we can relate to the vulnerability and the desperation that must have led the author of that prayer, which appeared first in the ninth century, to write it in the first place, and the pain in the heart of so many editors of so many Haggadot over the course of the last thousand years to keep including it in year after year, generation after generation, maybe this year we can see something that we could not see in years past. Shvochamatcha, pour out your wrath, is a dark story. It's a story that is drenched in pain, perhaps similar to the kind of pain that we are experiencing collectively in this time. And yet, as I reflect on this piece of liturgy that I have struggled with for so many years, I realized this year that the problem is not the sentiment itself, because I can empathize with those who hold a revenge fantasy in their hearts, those whose pain is so deep and profound that they just wish that an all-powerful God would come in and take care of business. The problem is not the sentiment itself. The problem, I believe, is its placement in the Seder. Because, as I said, this prayer appears at the end of our Seder, after we have eaten. We open our doors and express our desire for revenge. This is not the first time that we open our doors during our Seder. 
In fact, at the beginning of our Seder, there's another ritual door opening. Right when we begin to tell our story, right at the beginning of the Magid section, when our tables are set and our wine glasses are poured, we stand up and we open the door and we say, Kol dichfin yete v'yechol, let all who are hungry come and eat. Think about that for a moment. We refuse to even begin our story, let alone our meal, without the recognition that there are so many people around us who are not yet free, who do not yet have the liberation that we've come to this table to celebrate, in fact, who remain hungry even as we prepare to eat. This incredible invitation, kol dichpin, is derived from the Gemara. It's drawn from the example of the great sage Rav Huna, who is the Rosh Yeshiva in Surah. And we learn that he was not only learned, he was full of grace. In Masechet Ta'anit, in the Talmud, we read a series of extraordinary, truly extraordinary actions that Rav Huna took regularly, culminating in this practice Before every meal, when he would sit down to eat, he would open his door and declare, let all who are hungry come and eat. It's clear in the Gemara how extraordinary, how out of the ordinary Rav Huna's behavior is. He was a giant of his generation. Even Rava admits he'd never go that far. But when this tradition is incorporated into the Haggadah, It's not only those who are extraordinarily resourced or extraordinarily gracious who are called to engage in this practice, but every single one of us. Now, I want to say that many commentators go to great lengths over the course of time to explain that, don't worry, this is not meant to be taken literally. We are not really expecting hungry people to enter into our homes as we begin our Seder. But there have been times and there have been communities in Jewish history when this has been taken very literally. Elie Wiesel writes in his Haggadah that in his small town before the war, the Seder could not begin until every household had someone who was in need seated at that table. And so they would walk through the town searching for strangers, for the poor and the uprooted and the unhappy and the hungry to come and sit at their table as beloved guests. That is how sincere this invitation, kol dichpin, all who are hungry, come and eat, was taken in his time. And so it seems like at least for some Jews, at some points in history, that first door opening was meant not to be performative, but was meant to be transformative. And if that is the case, then I challenge us to come up with an argument of how shvocha the revenge fantasy, can possibly appear at the end of a transformative Seder ritual. Because is not the whole trajectory of the story of the exodus from Egypt, one from narrowness, to expansiveness, min hametzar karatiya, from out of Mitzrayim, where we start narrow, we end up with great expansive awareness. How can we possibly understand a Seder ritual that takes so seriously the transformative journey of the psyche that each of us is called to go into, that we are all called to see ourselves as though we personally walked through the straits of Mitzrayim in order to emerge and journey toward a land of promise. And yet there's this little revenge fantasy that we hold on to at the end of our story. It seems like the entire thrust of this narrative is to teach us that we are called to affirm the idea not only of our own liberation, but of collective liberation. That until all people are free, None of us is free. And therefore, one who has been liberated first must begin to tell their story by sharing our bounty, not only with our own, but also with others. Let all who are hungry come and eat. I want to say that this year, this line, for many of us, 
may be even harder to say than pour out your wrath. Hard because we know that in Gaza, the people are standing at the very edge of famine. As Leah Solomon wrote from Jerusalem this past week so delicately, before October 7th, although we knew that Jewish history had seen many tragedies, few of us alive today had experienced such a cataclysm. Never until now were we confronted with the excruciating task of holding another people's suffering, even as our own is so vast and so raw, let alone doing so when the perpetrators of the atrocities against us are members of that very people, and when the suffering of that people is being inflicted in large part by our own. And yet it is not despite this connection, but in profound awareness of it, Leah writes, that we must compel ourselves to see. Listen, when we compel ourselves to see, what we recognize is catastrophic human suffering. Even as we sit with our broken hearts to eat our Passover meals, many of us this year with empty chairs at our table to symbolically hold our captives, and their dear shattered families. Even still, we have to know that the children of Gaza today are scavenging for grass and animal feed, and that is unconscionable. As I have shared with you many times over the past several months, it is very hard, if not impossible, to hold empathy when you don't have social safety. That is a psychological reality. And some of us, have made the strategic determination early on that it would be deleterious to the war effort to feel too much for those who are on the other side of this story, whichever side of this story we most deeply and naturally incline. As a result, too many people have made a choice not to know the other's pain. We know how much it hurts us when people engage in October 7th denialism. Think about how much it hurts when Israeli officials continue to deny that there even is a catastrophic food shortage altogether. There's no hunger in Gaza, they say. This is a shame because the reality is beyond devastating. It is in our own sacred texts that we read, Tovim hayu halecharev mechalalei ra'av. In Eicha, we read, those who die by the sword are better off than those who suffer from hunger. Or as the rabbis explain in Bava Batra, it's only reasonable to assert that famine is worse than the sword because one who dies from famine suffers so profoundly before departing from this world. At least someone who dies from the sword doesn't suffer. Of course, the rabbis then go on to say that captivity is even worse than all of these. What a horror that we are living through a time in which all of these forms of human suffering and heartache are experienced not in the abstract and so very close to home. The whole point here, I believe, is that we would be wise not to downplay the human suffering that is caused by any of these. Meanwhile, we have to admit that hunger in our time has never been because there's simply not enough food. We have always had enough food to feed every single hungry person on this planet. Hunger in our time has always been a man-made disaster. It is not a failure of resources. It is a failure of will. And the impending famine in Gaza is no different. The resources of the are there. They've been there all along. Feeding people has simply not been seen as a political priority, neither for some Israeli officials, nor clearly for Hamas, nor for many world leaders. In fact, numerous forces have been working to actively thwart the delivery of essential food and medicine, essentially turning food into a weapon of war. This is what I want us to think about today. As we sit down at our Seder tables, when we open the door that first time, expressing empathy, trying to invite into our homes and into our hearts the reality of ongoing hunger, all who are hungry, come and eat. Will that action be performative or will that action be transformative? 
I wondered when I read about Rav Huna what made him behave so incredibly generously, so extraordinarily generous. The fact is that Rav Huna came up in poverty. He was so poor, the Gemara tells us, that he once sold his belt in order to have enough money to buy wine for Kiddush on Shabbat. That matters. I believe that the fact that Rav Huna knew the ache and humiliation of hunger was precisely what allowed him or compelled him to act with such generosity toward others who were hungry. For you know the heart of the stranger. Ki gerim ha'itim be'eretz mitrayim. For you know the pain. You yourselves were enslaved in Egypt. There's a choice that is before us. There almost always is. We who have suffered so profoundly and who tell and retell the story of this suffering generation after generation can hold on to a fantasy of rage and revenge or we can allow that story to do its holy work on our hearts. For me this year, I am going to strive to open my door in righteousness and not in rage. This month, the New Israel Fund has launched a campaign to feed the people of Gaza through the World Central Kitchen and the International Rescue Committee. For six months, the New Israel Fund has been funding emergency support and resettlement for refugees inside Israel who've been forced to flee their homes from the north and from the south because of attacks from Hamas and Hezbollah. They have been funding Israelis and Palestinians working together in mixed cities, planting the seeds for a just and shared future. And now they are funding humanitarian support for Palestinians in Gaza because there are 1.1 million people there who are on the brink of famine. And that is a moral catastrophe. And because we believe that it is a Jewish moral obligation to see the hungry, to recognize our own story as strangers and as hungry people, and then to do everything in our power to help feed them. After April 1st, when the World Central Kitchen staff were killed while they were in the midst of food delivery in Gaza, some of my family and friends in Israel were grieving deeply, and they said that they believed that this might be a watershed moment. They hoped that this might be the beginning of a shift. I have prayed in the aftermath of each and every terrible turn in this terrible war that it might be the moment that changes everything. The moment that leaders recognize that they need to pursue a different course, not a course of callousness and cruelty and eternal war, not the path of endless heartache and endless hunger, instead a path toward a permanent end to this war, a return of every single one of those hostages, a massive collective commitment to rebuild Gaza, a path toward a just and lasting peace. We should continue to pray. And even as we do, we must act. This campaign is one of the ways that we can do that. I understand in a way different than I ever have before, the desire for revenge. I also understand that our tradition calls us again and again to tell and retell a different story. One that if we told with sincerity and with open hearts, not for the sake of performance, but for the sake of actually engaging in spiritual transformation, we would not land at revenge as the only answer. Increasingly, over the last several years, new Haggadot are including a different way to end our Seder other than Shvoch Hamatcha. It's called Shvoch Ahavatcha. Not pour out your wrath, but instead pour out your love. Some people argue that this text actually originates in the 16th century, back in Germany. But others are quick to point out that maybe actually it isn't that old and it's truly a forgery and it was written instead 
by a rabbi only a hundred years ago, a rabbi who fled Galicia and then Vienna and ultimately came to this country fleeing the Nazis. To my mind, this scholarly debate does not diminish the power of this poem, of this new liturgy, of this attempt to address liturgically the need for another narrative, another end to our story. It doesn't matter to me if this prayer emerged 500 years ago or 100 years ago, or even if it emerged yes yesterday. Because what I think it's revealing is clearly there is a profound need to draw from our broken hearts not only a desire for revenge, but a reminder that we can and ultimately we must choose love. Every generation is called to choose. I often quote one of my teachers, Rabbi Harold Schulweis, who insisted that the great question of our lives has been and continues to be, how are we to master the trauma? How are we to confront the world? How are we to extract meaning and morale from our nightmare so that we and our children can live with wisdom and courage and hope? That question, which he wrote for a post-Holocaust world, has been brought back to the forefront so plainly and so painfully in a post-October 7th reality. What story will we tell from our suffering? Will we allow that story to be not only performative, but transformative, so that we might emerge from the deep dive into our own pain, our own liberation and redemption with hearts full of compassion, empathy, and a true sense of possibility? I hope and I pray that each and every one of us is able to make that choice, the choice our Jewish community and the choice that I believe the world needs us to make in this moment. Shabbat Shalom.